Now you come to the plastic graveyard. It's a disgrace for mankind, I think, that you find this in animals. The plastic we discard ends up on our plate. It's entering our body. Just here. Just, just yeah. behind his house. Yeah. <laughs> We're into an environmental catastrophe. The ocean where life on Earth began is being turned into a synthetic soup. And to understand why, there is no better place to come than Mumbai. For, for Indians, it's like every dirt must go into the waterways. Now, the exact problem of plastic in ocean is this. Now you come to the plastic graveyard here in the ocean. The plastic graveyard. Yeah, there it's... is plastic everywhere. Yeah. Now you see the enormity of the problem. The whole beach is just strewn with plastic. Yes, strewn with plastic. This isn't litter dropped on the beach. It's come from the sea. Twice a day, the tide brings in yet more. This is devastation, Thomas. Have you seen so much plastic at a beach? I've never seen so much yeah. plastic at a beach. This isn't a beach. It's horrendous. Horrendous. This is a rubbish dump, not yeah, a beach. Yeah, beach. This is the most dangerous, the blue one. It's a single-use plastic. And this, if it gets down, you had it. This is all in the mall. This is from the mall. From people, the shopping mall? Shopping mall. This is so prevalent in Indian shopping malls. So people Put take stuff. home their shopping, they unpack yeah. their shopping. And then dump they it. They throw the bag. Yeah. They throw it dump and forget it. it. Forget it. This isn't their problem, it's somebody else's problem now. Yeah, they think, no, not even their, somebody else's problem, it's the government's problem. People think the Prime Minister of this country must come on the beach and clean. I mean, have you seen this much litter ever, Thomas? Just look no, at this. I haven't. I mean, it's imagine actually... what the fishes must be going through, what the birds would be going through. Worldwide, we're dumping the equivalent of one rubbish truck of trash into the water every minute. By 2050, the plastic in the sea could weigh more than all the fish. It's actually quite upsetting to see so much plastic on a beautiful beach. I'm mentally disturbed every time I come here, you know, because it's, it's cleaning. But we are not going to give up, Thomas. We, this will continue. This war is going to continue. Uh, I've lived all my life on cost. As a child, I remember with my schoolmates, then in college with my college mates, we used to come play in the water. He remembers this beach from his childhood for its white sand and clean sea. He returned as an adult to live and was horrified. The first time you came to the balcony like this and you, you looked out on, on the beach, what did you see? I thought it had become like a garbage dump. My ocean had turned into a garbage dump where you see only plastic from one end to the other. So it was always... A special bond with the ocean always is a child. And I always thought, you know, oceans, ocean is like a, everything to me. It's a, a bond which can't be broken. Something very deep. It goes to your roots and your bones, actually. It goes to your roots and bones. And when you see that bond snapping, it sends shiver down your bones then. But then my human instinct told me that you have to do something about it. 
So he started the world's biggest beach clean with 4,000 tonnes of trash cleared in just one year. For his zeal, the United Nations made him an environmental champion. So the ocean throws it up. Ocean pukes out every two months, three months, you know. And if you don't clean it, it will get piled on, piled on, piled on. But the sand seems to take it in. I think, you know, single-use plastic has no place in 21st century. I'm of a very firm believer. It has no place uh, in this world. And but it's, it's high... so convenient, of course. It may be convenient for some, but it's just not convenient for the fishes and the marine creatures and marine birds, you know. It's their house. It's, it's there where they belong. They live, they survive. They're crying for justice because we have messed up with their houses. And I don't take it kindly. No species have a right to destroy somebody else's house. So we're coming into the creek now. This is what it is, just wow. look at the amount of pile. This is right on the seafront. Hi, Praveen, how are you? <laughs> yeah. There used to be plenty of life in these waters. Now the fishing boats lie idle. Uh, if we put a net, so we'll get just a lot of plastic and uh, all the waste product which are flowing in the creek. So there's no point fishing here? No point fishing here because uh, uh, all the net will be filled with the plastic only, that's all. And this is in your lifetime that you've seen that change? Yeah, yeah, because when we were kid, we, had, you, we used to see a lot of fishing in the creek only, but now as we grown, last 25-30 uh, years, we have seen the, all the fish has gone, only the pollution. For me, it's not about others. People ask, ask me, oh, you are an inspiration or a difference. I'm doing it for myself. Thomas, I'm very clear in my head. I have not come here for sainthood. I, I have not come here for sainthood. I have come here to clean because I feel there's a need in me. And if it becomes everybody's need, you know, things will be sorted out. This plastic man will come into a world of colour, bright and shining surfaces, where childish hands find nothing to break. He is surrounded on every side by tough, safe, clean materials which human thought has created. All of his toys, his cot, the unbreakable bottle from which he feeds, all made of plastic. So this was a book actually, it's, it's called um, Plastics, and the first edition was from the 1940s, uh, this edition's 1945, and I found it actually on my grandfather's bookshelf after he passed away, and I wasn't studying plastics at the time, but I remember thinking it was quite interesting because it was people's perspective of the benefits that plastic would bring. All those benefits of plastic have been realised. In less than a lifetime, it's infiltrated almost every aspect of our daily existence. But it has a darker side, and not just in the developing world. It's difficult to walk on a shoreline now and walk more than a few metres without finding the debris. It's covering every part of our planet, including remote places like the deep sea, like the polar regions. We're finding plastic accumulating there. Richard was one of the first to raise the alarm. What have we got here is another plastic bag fresh Some, somebody's uh... freshly cooked today it's the butcher's selection <laughs> okay maybe hot um, so the product's been consumed yes packaging discarded yeah and we'll just stay there for goodness it's, knows how long it's going to persist for a long time of all the plastics we produce every year and that's 300 million tons that tonnage brings many benefits lightweight parts in cars airplanes artificial body parts plastics aren't the enemy here it's the single use items and that's 40% of all the production as things that are used and discarded within a year. Some plastic is only used for a matter of minutes and then dumped. So you almost got to reverse 60 years of training for a throwaway society. You know, in the 1950s, we didn't have these throwaway things. That's what we've all grown up 
to is to regard these things as throwaway and valueless. And so is it really such a surprise that we find some of them being thrown away and entering the environment? This is our trash, recklessly disposed of, perhaps many miles in land, that's come back to haunt us. In my view, the scale has passed a critical point that actually I consider there's enough evidence that we need to take action now. It's this rapid adaptability, together with the attractiveness, usefulness, and low cost of the plastic itself, that has made this industry one of the fastest growing in the nation's history. The future of plastics is bright indeed. We use 320 million tons of plastic every year. It's cheap, light, and durable. You can freeze it, stack it, any which way. Used in everything from cotton bud sticks to spacecraft. Lift off. All we need is this burner, this flask, and this reflux condenser. Uh, just a moment, please. Four percent of world oil production is used as a raw ingredient. Chemicals are added, but they can be toxic. And just five percent is effectively recycled. I've been washed up. It's when it's thrown away without a thought that the plastic problem begins. This is typical then of what, what you'll find down here in, in the sewer. So. so this is the sort of thing that we find washed up, clogging up things. So you've got. These, so these are wet wipes. So that's a wet wipe, yeah. So people just don't think that wet wipes are, are, are a problem. They just flush them down the toilet. Yeah, so I think people think once it, if it goes through the U-bend on your toilet and it's gone, then it's out of sight and very much out of mind. And um, we find all sorts down here. So it's, it's not just wet wipes, but sanitary products, um, fat, ear, uh, cotton buds, condoms, all sorts of things. But this isn't paper. I mean, this is months old. That, that would have been down here for many months. And as you can see, it's not disintegrated at all. It's still because intact. it's plastic? It's plastic. It's, it's not paper like, you, like your toilet roll. The only thing that should go down the toilet is toilet paper, poo and wee. Yeah. Um, and everything else should go in the bin. If this was in the flow and we had a storm, it would obviously float on top of the flow we're over into one of our overflows and end up in the River Thames. We take uh, between three and five hundred tonnes of plastic out of the river every year. We find the junk of ages in the river. We found stuff in the Thames that's been there for a thousand years. But it's only from the last 30 years you get this plastic problem. It's really only when you look closely at the Thames that you realise just how much rubbish is in it. Volunteers are surveying the trash to work out where it comes from. They're looking at small areas of foreshore and itemising everything that's in that area, whether it's food-related plastic, food-related polystyrene... Cotton bud sticks. Cotton bud sticks, nappies, syringes, wet wipes, lighters. You would not believe the number of items. Bottle tops? Four. Four bottle tops. Yeah. Many people don't realise that we have a separate freshwater rainwater system to the sewage system. So those drains and gutters in most of our streets, they go directly into a stream. So all the litter and stuff that you drop in the street, it'll get washed into the gutter, washed down a drain pipe, and from there it'll flow out into a stream. And that stream will connect up with a tributary maybe, and it'll flow onward until it reaches the River Thames. And where does the River Thames go? It goes out to sea. So you're going to find the wildlife in the world's oceans affected by the litter that started in a little village in the Thames Basin. Right, welcome on board. Thank yeah. you very much. Let's go and find some microplastics.
From rivers to the sea, the journey of plastic continues. But it's what happens here that makes it such a threat. So we've got a manta net in the water. You can see there's these fins spread out to the side. I mean, a little bit like the edge of a manta ray, if you like. It's helping to keep the, the net buoyant at the water surface, which is where we'd expect to find a lot of plastics. With this particular approach, what we're really looking for is a small piece of the, the microplastics, anything less than five millimeters in size. So that's not microscopic. You could see them to the naked eye. We're trawling for those tiny pieces, fragments of everyday items broken down by sunlight and the churning waves over many years. They are a menace in the ocean. You could take, you know, a large plastic bottle you might be familiar with, that might break down into millions of small pieces of plastic. It's quite difficult to put a, a, a robust quantity But where is the, there. But there are a few marine creatures that would eat an entire bottle, but exactly. if you've got a bottle breaking down into millions of pieces, that's yeah. millions of opportunities for a small fish to consume it. That's right. Well, it, it opens up the potential for ingestion to a much wider diversity of organisms. So we've got quite a bit of debris in there. What we really need to do is to pick through this carefully in the lab. I'll, put, I'll transfer them to the jar, but you can see we have got bits of plastic on some of these leaves. Plastic takes decades, perhaps even centuries, to disintegrate into tiny pieces. But it never completely disappears. We've got the sample that we got in the mountainette this morning. Um, what I want to do is see if we can go through it and pull out any pieces that look a little bit like plastic. Or we see a range of different common polymers, you know, polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene. To identify exactly what these are, we'd need a more detailed forensic analysis. We find just a handful of pieces in our 15-minute trawl, but it's still hugely significant. What we're finding is, on average, one or two pieces of plastic per cubic metre of seawater. So, you know, it's not an island of debris that we're talking about here. But if you scale that up and you think about how many cubic metres of water there are in Plymouth Sound, around the coast of the UK, around the world, suddenly you realise that we're talking about millions, actually trillions of pieces of plastic of this size that are now floating around the, the surface of the seawaters around, around the globe. Hundreds of species of marine organism encounter plastic at the sea surface or in the water column, and many of those encounters are harmful, if not fatal. This is Tessel. It's Holland in a tiny scale, so you have every type of countryside is there. A lot of birds. And very uh, much birds. The beaches are wild, the seabirds abundant. And the, the gulls themselves, they're just resting here. Yes, yeah, yeah. Do you get large flocks of them? Yeah, especially when fishing fleet comes in. All of them occasionally have plastic in their stomach, but the one that has it regularly is the former. A little bit they probably get through uh, the fish they eat, that has eaten plastic from deeper water layers, but most of it is from the surface. Most of it is floating plastic. When dead fulmers wash ashore, their stomachs are examined. The birds give scientists a chance to gauge just how much plastic is out in the open ocean. But have you tried to do a calculation of how much plastic is in the bird population of the North Sea or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fulmers in the North Sea, it's about six tons of plastic. Six tons of plastic yeah. will pass through a fulmer, fulmers, yes. all the fulmers in the North Sea, every year? Yes. Six tons? Yes. That's a lot of plastic? Yeah, 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 it is. Dead birds are sent to Jan's lab from hundreds of miles away. The post-mortem isn't for the squeamish. This bird has died slowly. It's, 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 there's no fat remaining. So a healthy fulmer, you would not see these feather pins stick out. It would be a smooth layer of fat. So it's just burnt up all the fat yeah, that it has while yeah, it's died. Once you've eaten too much of these uh, muscle proteins, you're gone. So that looks a heavy stomach. There's quite a bit of stuff in here. I'm not sure what it is, but we'll see. 
So you can see there's a lot of plastic in here. Goodness me. So it is a, full of plastic. Yeah, so this gizzard is basically full of plastic. And, uh, and what would the consequences have been that for the bird? You know, if a stomach is full, it gives a false sense of satiation. So it just doesn't and, feel and, hungry. And it doesn't eat uh, as much. So yeah. could that have been why? I mean, this, this bird has clearly starved. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that well, could be a contributing yeah, factor. Yeah, yes, yes, certainly. So what does that tell you about the life of that bird? Well, uh, it's, it's suffering from our mistakes, and uh, it, it's, it's a disgrace for mankind, I think, to, that you find this in animals. The wildlife tells us what, what we are doing wrong, and so in the end, everything we do to wildlife, we do to ourselves. And so, so even if you don't care about wildlife, you should care about yourself. Cleaned and carefully laid out, this is the inventory of the Fulmer's Gizzard. 18 pieces of plastic weighing just over half a gram. It doesn't sound much, but scale it up to a human and it amounts to a lunchbox of trash. I would not like my children, I have one, uh, my son to have this in his stomach. The bigger the bird, the bigger the pieces. And an albatross has a gargantuan appetite. You can find complete objects in there, like complete toothbrush or fisheries floaters, golf ball. In the end, it will come back to us because the, these birds eat a particular size of plastics, but in the, so once the fulmer has processed it to microplastics, there will be uh, shrimps in the water or small soil plankton that eats it. That stuff is eaten by fishes. We eat the fish. At some stage, things you see happening in, in nature will come back to us. First light on India's east coast, fishermen are already out catching dinner in filthy water. Plastic lines the banks. But it's the peril below the waves that alarms conservationists here. Akil is taking me diving. When you're down there, you see all this marine life and you, you see that all, all these guys, all this marine life actually being friendly to you. No, in a way, they're not exactly scared of you. So you actually get used to this and that. You feel part of it in a way. I mean, we are the invasive, invasive species. Everywhere we go, we create destruction. I don't see how that is fair to the world, right? We are part of this ecosystem, right? For, for us being part of this ecosystem, we do not have a right to destroy it. One, two, three. Five kilometers off the coast, there's a reef. We descend into the murky deep. The sandy seabed stirred up by a racing current. This is a ghost net. Plastic fishing gear that's snagged on the rocks and been abandoned. Thousands of miles of fishing nets and lines are drifting in the world's oceans, entangling any creature that comes too close. We don't mind them fishing as long as they don't destroy it, but they don't understand how not to destroy it. Our interview is interrupted. Fishermen bump our boat as they desperately try to save their net from the reef. And then these nets get dragged by the currents, and if there is a reef like this on the way, they get stuck. It annoys me a lot because it annoys me how careless people can be, you know, and ignorant to everything. 
I was actually caught up in a net, but I couldn't see what, what it was. I just felt it. Now, if I can't see it, if I can't understand what, what there is, you would imagine what the fish life would be like, you know? One of our instructors, Andy, was doing some uh, dives. He came up and he actually saw this floating lump, which was splashing around. So he went close and saw there were two turtles. And they were completely caught up. Now, the turtles are not exactly, you know, they don't have gills. You, you can't, they can't breathe underwater. So the way they actually usually die with these nets and everything is because they can't, they can't breathe and they suffocate and die. So they, they, it needed immediate action. So he and he basically took the knives out and started cutting the nets off and everything. It took, it took him around 15, 20 minutes to free these two turtles. But at the end, it was a successful rescue and we didn't find any damages to them, luckily, thankfully. Why is the marine environment worth protecting? It is worth protecting because one of the things is it's not ours to destroy. If the marine life is destroyed, the reef gets destroyed. If the reef gets destroyed, the land, the coastal areas will obviously get destroyed because the reef is not there to protect them from the ocean anymore. The moment that's absent, that's going to directly come into the land. Now, every single person in the coastline will get affected by it. I just would love if people just show, show a little bit more compassion to the entire life which is around them. I'm just trying to prove that we're being affected in a similar way, actually. We're trapping ourselves. It's affecting us very badly, and it's, it's, it's I mean, it's time to reconsider our way of consuming and the way of disposing of things. A sobering portfolio by a photographer who uses art to shatter complacency over ocean plastic. It does look like you're almost strangling life here. Is that what you think plastic is doing? In terms of entanglement, that's clearly what's happening. And to ourselves, yes, that was the idea of, of slow suffocation, that uh, it's, not, uh, it's not something which is happening overnight. It's a very uh, slow-paced uh, problem, and it's, it's, it's yeah, slowly killing us. I'm doing a small art photography kind of uh, project uh, where I'm doing an analogy between plastic ingestion uh, of marine life and, and what would happen it would, if it would actually happen to us. Yeah. So creating like some food photography, but made with stuff I found on the beach. Artwork around that is just to create awareness on this issue. Well, I mean, this is beach combing with a difference, isn't it? Most people are looking out for shells, but you're looking for the potential in trash. Yeah, there's more trash than shells. Some are like this one, yeah. It's just a piece of plastic, yeah. which is years probably, and this will get eaten by a small fish. Yeah. And then bigger fish will eat many of these small fish. We ate so much of this small one, and it's just I mean, it's getting in our plate. It's in our food chain. Yeah, yeah, it's in our food and, chain. And From that's the very really top. what you're trying to show with your photography, isn't it? The link between the plastic and uh, what we're consuming. Yeah, it's toxic stuff, so it's obviously affecting us. We just don't see it yet. He's surrounded by plastic. It piles up in a dump by his house. Inside, he sorts through his hall. Yeah, I think I'll try with that. So what are you doing? What are you recreating? So I'm thinking some kind of fancy cereal some kid would be drawn to, like... It's going to trigger a reflection around, I mean, what's, what's there in the shot. I mean, how it's affecting wildlife in general and how it's starting to, I mean, enter the food chain. All Belgians are... Um, really look forward towards what we call the muscle season, which starts like officially in the beginning of July. It's like a big event that, uh, you know, the muscles are there. And then, you know, throughout summer and uh, early autumn, Belgians eat muscles. Great. Here we go. Thank you very much. So, Colin, is this a... A, a very Belgian preparation of mussels? It is indeed. It's the, the simplest one and, and, and to me the most tasty of one. It's uh, just the mussels yeah. with added onion and celery. Let's put it in the, in, in the pot and it's cooked for five minutes and that's what you get. A mussel is about 20 to 25 liters of water 
uh, per day. So there's lots of uh, water coming in. That water contains microplastics. This portion of Marcus contains about 90 uh, particles of plastic. Uh, we've estimated that uh, uh, a Belgium would eat anything between 2,000 and 11,000 microparticles per year. 11,000? Yes. Our children will be eating even more as plastics accumulate in the ocean. By the end of the century, Europeans are likely to be consuming as many as three quarters of a million pieces of plastic every year. Using all the knowledge we know and common sense uh, tells me if we continue doing this, we will at one point, sooner or later, reach the threshold where there will be effects. So that's, that's why we need to do something about it now. This is a batch of mussels we bought in Ostend yesterday, and I'd like to get out the tissue now to do digestion and to look well and to see if they have taken up any microplastics. So you have to prepare them in a special way? We've developed a, a technique which dissolves all the, the tissue, and what we're left with is in fact any microplastic with, which would be in the tissue. Keep on looking if we see something suspicious. This is quite peculiar. This, this red dot here, you... Yeah, indeed. This I'm going to zoom in a bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pink color uh, and it's a rectangular shape. Based on what we've seen before, this surely is a microplastic. Detailed CT scans of living muscles have shown the pieces aren't just in the stomach. They're actually in the body tissue. There's some really hard evidence, like what you buy in the shop, there will be some plastic in there. The first risk assessments in the lab show microplastics can cross from our stomachs to our bloodstream. Just a few dozen particles a year for now, but by the end of the century, it could be 4,000 pieces accumulating year after year. I've asked many physicians, colleagues, professors, and, and so on, what does microplastic, what could microplastic do when it gets into our blood system? Uh, and the blunt answer was, we don't know. So we know that plastics can get into the body, yeah. but we don't know the significance of no. that. We don't know whether they do any harm. No, we don't. Would you say that we need to do those experiments? I think we need to investigate that. It's a, it's a concern. Now we've established that they do enter our body and can stay there for quite a while. Uh, we, we do need to know the fate of those pl plastics. Where do they go? Where they, are they encapsulated and bought by tissue and, and forgotten about by the body? Or are they causing inflammation? Or are they doing other things? Are chemicals le leaching out of these uh, microplastics and, and, and then having a chemical uh, a toxicity uh, caused by these microplastics? We don't know. And actually, we do need to know because we know it's entering our body. So, I mean, I, I'm not worried about my lifetime anymore, about plastics, but perhaps uh, the next generation or two generations uh, further on uh, might say, you know, they left us a, a rotten <laughs> plastic uh, legacy because now we, we, we are suffering in various ways from, from that legacy. The Andamans is home, it's where, where I feel the most comfortable, it's where I feel I belong the best and it's just such a beautiful, serene little place. You can't help but feel the love that you feel for the islands over here. Everything is so different from what I've always seen on land and the way things move, the way creatures survive camouflage, the colors, everything is new and it's something that is wonderful to experience all the time. We found plastic that's uh, been tucked into corals. We 
we found plastic that's tucked into rock crevices and all of this sort of suffocates the animals that are around there. Um, they think it's food sometimes and they try and eat it, which obviously they can't digest. And then there's the plastic that floats mid-water that doesn't really settle down until it reaches the shore. And um, if it happens to be a plastic bag, it sort of resembles a jellyfish, which are turtle food. So turtles could engulf it. Plastic bags are banned on these Indian islands, but they're still at the mercy of the ocean currents. The waste that comes in through the currents comes in from Southeast Asia, so countries like Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, and it's a lot of footwear, a lot of bottles, so plastic bottles, things that float easily, and all of it is brought in by the current but some plastic travels much further, accumulating in huge circulating masses of water in the North and the South Atlantic, the North and the South Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. These are the five great gyres. It's all linked. It's all one ocean. It was a wonderful childhood. All my friends that are of my age, we still talk about it. We all had lovely memories about what we'd done and how free we were. I mean, the loch was crystal clear. Even in the UK, remote communities are being affected. And actually, it's not too bad today. Does uh, this is a good day? I've seen it over the wall, that depth. So it's... And that's a good couple of metres. Easily. All the time, it's getting caught in little nooks and crannies all down the loch. And then when you get a surge of a tide, water, you know, a high tide, it comes out and lands here. Mary was born in the village and never left. It was a childhood paradise, not anymore. Plastic wasn't a thing that we ever had. You know, there was never any plastic and there was never anything interfering when we were swimming or jumping into the loch and hit a plastic bottle. So there was nothing like that. And the shore was clean. That's not our rubbish. That came from somewhere else. The community is overwhelmed. Volunteers clean up what they can. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a, a litter sink because they're, they're at the end of one of the sea lochs. Literally, everything's coming down the Clyde from across the Atlantic. The oceans cover the whole world. The litter can come from anywhere. But this is where it ends. There's nowhere else for it to go here. We find um, items of litter on Scottish beaches from Australia, from Japan. Once it enters the ocean, it can end up anywhere at all. So really, marine litter is a global problem. But most of the rubbish comes from elsewhere in the UK. Well, from full bags, guys, that's 30 kilos. 30 kilos, 30 minutes with extras. Kind of tells the story for itself. <laughs> it's nice when you've been out in, in the wilds to, to come back to uh, the comfort of a good Scottish B&B. Exactly, and smell the fresh bread and the nice marmalade, yeah. Christina moved here two years ago to open a B&B. So this is our one of our premier rooms. And it's a stunning view. If you can look beyond the plastic on the shore. I've had actually quite a few people asking me, why is the community so filthy? Why, why do you have a landfill out there? So is the assumption uh, by outsiders that this is rubbish that's come from the village? From us, yeah. Yeah, because they don't understand. Tourists are beginning to go elsewhere. The effect on the community can't be underestimated. They've tried to deal with it on their own. They've done whatever they possibly can. It hasn't worked. It's still happening, and they're tired. And that is being reflected in the amount of places that are for sale here now, the businesses that are closing. This community is giving up, and they've been left to deal with this on their own for so long that they do say it's, it's, it's a thankless task. We can't do anything about it. But in, in the face of, of the plastic tide, do you not feel overwhelmed? Um, I'm incredibly overwhelmed. Um, I may not have been born here and lived my life here, but I'm going to live the rest of my life here. So this is a, a complete 
total life investment for me. And cleaning up the lock cleaning is actually part of your mission. Cleaning up the lock is completely one of my missions, yes. You've been doing this for 61 yeah, weeks been, now? Yeah, this is 62 weeks now. 62 weeks? Yeah. And there's still rubbish here? Yeah. But you see the difference, do you? Oh my God, it's a huge difference. The white sand is visible, which was never there. This is what is what I, we call it maintenance now. This is maintenance? Maintenance. So and yeah, it's all what, the way along here. Yeah, just... it used to be like huge. It's about consistency, persistency, you know. Do it every time. Don't make it an event. Don't make it a one-day affair. As more volunteers muster for his cleanup brigade, Afros gets closer to restoring his beach. It's an opportunity, Thomas. Be positive, wear your gloves and be on the beach. So be how do you motivate all these volunteers? Uh, they're all highly motivated bunch of people. Uh, they love ocean. Let me tell you, Thomas, as Manod says, we wait for it. I'll, I'll use a little stronger word. We are, it's addictive. Addictive? Yes. It's addictive. Yes. Cleaning yes. up rubbish is addictive. Yes. It's yes. addictive. Yes. Yes. The day, the week, the, the week which we don't do it, uh, we feel uh, Le left we, out. We totally yeah. give up our outings and <laughs> come on, come late night parties. But call Ajay and all that. We feel Everything that we, we are not up. cleaning only the beach, we are cleaning our hearts. But you must have been cleaning down here and then seeing people bringing more trash. In fact, I've just seen somebody bringing yeah, some yeah, rubbish in the background there, just no, bringing no, it out. gradually changing their mindsets also. also. Yeah, so you try and persuade them. Counselling them, yeah. counselling them, yeah. meeting yeah. them. Of we need to educate Every them. Need you to do educate, educate them. them. Yeah. And I suppose with you cleaning it up, it, it sets an example, doesn't it? Instead of cribbing and blaming government, this is our duty too. Yeah. So we should also do this, one hour, two hour, whatever time we can give. Once you've done this beach, where will you go next? We go to the next beach. There are 19 beaches and when we go to the next beach, it's the locals who have to stand up. Yeah. I'm just going to provoke them. Like I provoked all my volunteers, I provoked them on and off, on and off. And then they come automatically, you know, it's my ocean, my beach, my love for it, you know. <laughs> now you're waiting for the day to swim again. Do you think that day will come? Very soon. Yeah. Very soon? Very soon. With the action of so many people, yes. one day you can swim yes. again? With the VRV effort, very soon. Yes, we'll succeed. You will succeed? Yes. yes. And we'll leave something for the next generation. The next generation, the young generation here. Yes. The see your t-shirt. Save the beach. Save the beach. Yeah. yeah. And maybe one day you'll be able to play cricket on the beach. That'd be nice, with no rubbish. No plastic. Yeah? I don't put a bit on the beach. You don't put a bit on the beach. You just clean up everybody else's mess. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, good luck to you, young man. One day you can sit back and enjoy it. We are 1.5 billion Indians. Imagine three billion hands picking it up. How many pieces of plastic can it be? It may take a generation before we are used to not throwing plastic away, but uh, I think uh, by telling the story it's a problem, gradually it will take effect. The only way to stop the plastic tide is to, to manage it in a, in a better way. I believe we can have and we can use plastics to our advantage without the need for this accumulation of waste. And that's what brings me hope, really. If we cast our minds forward to 2040 and we imagine, you know, Plastic Man's 100th birthday, he's taken his great, great, great grandchildren to the beach. They now have to wade out and paddle out through a slick of plastic that's accumulating at the top of the shoreline on, on, on every beach that we find worldwide. Plastic Man scrapes his hand through the sand and he realizes that the sand itself is now full of small pieces of plastic. Does he reflect that it's a very different place to the world that he was born in at the start of our plastic age? Is that future essential? In my view, it's avoidable. <laughs>